it's a very significant move in the direction we have been moving. You know, two years ago at Cagney, I think it was February 16, I talked about moving more in the big markets, starting with the U.S. in an end-to-end -end format to make sure our businesses went all the way to the customer. At the same time, we talked about in some of the smaller markets having something called freedom within a framework so we'd be more agile in small markets. This takes it to the a, a next big step. At the same time, it changes some other things about how we staff and manage talent to reinforce this choice, to make sure we're more agile, accountable, and able to win in both big markets and in smaller, more volatile markets. So does this mean you're listening to your new board member, Nelson Peltz? I listen to all my board members. And, and we start with listening to the consumer, but we also, as we lead the organizational change, we did certainly consult with all 12 of our external board members and we have a very active and engaged board and they've been active and engaged but certainly any good ideas we'll take I don't care where they come if it allows us to grow faster that's a good thing do you have any regrets about the way that the company approached that proxy fight and fought so hard against him joining no because I think it was important that we established what we believed was right P&G is a company about winning over time, and we're about doing it the right way. Our purpose, values, and principles guide everything we do. So when one challenges in some areas on things that we didn't think made sense, we thought it made sense to stand up for what was right. As we learned more and more and talked, as often happens with dialogue, we were able to find some common ground, and we listened to investors. We do believe you listen to your investors and your other stakeholders. You did see the best sales growth in years yes. in the last quarter and investors are trying to figure out with that tough macroeconomic environment just how sustainable it is. Yeah, to me that the the best evidence I can give for sustainability is look where we were two years ago, last year and this year and what you see is a consistent improvement in the number of brands growing, the number of countries that are growing, which says we're doing it in a way that is sustainable. It's not by an aggressive promotion in a, in a market or with a customer, it's by this superiority strategy that is really substantive better products that are meaningfully better, not a little bit better so you can make a claim, but better so that if you use the product, the brand, and go back to what you are using before, you notice the difference, so you come back. And there's many products here and many brands mm -hmm. that really make a difference. And if the consumer really loves it and he or she comes back, that's a sustainable approach. We will have to deal with and are dealing with, to me, one of the more difficult foreign exchange environments for a U.S. domiciled company. We're dealing with difficulties in commodities because of you know, oil prices and others over time. They've come down recently, but in general, commodity costs are higher. In transportation and warehousing, especially in the U.S., costs are higher. You think inflation in the broader economy is going to be a problem? It, there's not a lot of evidence that inflation has grown a lot in the U.S., and it's, it tends to be certain categories where input costs have gone up a good bit, and that's not all categories. Uh, and the other thing is, over time, we will find opportunities through productivity to either offset or to bring innovation where the consumer chooses to buy by the new brand or the new form or whatever delights the consumer more. Uh, we watch carefully if the value ratings go down and certainly in aggregate we'll see what happens with inflation but certainly what we've seen in the U.S. and in many countries it hasn't gotten ahead of itself. There are certainly some of the more volatile countries where foreign exchange has changed significantly, and we have raised prices significantly. You are seeing some escalating inflation, certainly places like Argentina and Turkey, two markets we have a meaningful business. That's a very different story than the U.S. No, the U.S., I mean, the consumer environment has been strong. Spending has yes. been strong. Do you see that continuing into next year? Certainly there's no evidence, either unemployment or consumer confidence or any other of the macro factors that would cause me to lose confidence of the U.S. being a great market to do business in. Right now, it's one of the reasons why we're telling all of our category leaders we need to win in the U.S., which is why I take a lot of confidence on the sustainability of the strategy in that we're growing share the past one month, three months, six months, and moving now to 12 12 months in the U.S. Getting it right in our biggest market is a strong statement on the sustainability of the action plan of the strategy. But the overall U.S. economy, Fed's raising rates, does that feel appropriate to you? Well, they've raised rates certainly a number of times, but the absolute rates still aren't very high by any historical measure. Uh, certainly we're concerned if it gets ahead of itself, that would be a problem. Anything that causes consumer confidence to drop significantly or starts to weigh heavily on the growth rate of the broader economy would concern me. Uh, but you're not seeing that? Not in a big way. No, our categories generally, the, the, the 10 categories we do business generally have been pretty stable in the U.S. or slightly up this year, not down. So I'm not seeing evidence that the categories in which we do business, these kind of categories, 
are slowing down. And in fact, when we bring innovation and we do our job right, we can actually accelerate the growth of the category because the innovation often brings something that may be higher price but better value. And that's true of things like Olay Whips, it's true of Tide Pods, it's true of Discreet Boutique, it's true of Pampers Pure. So many of these are products that give you either a new form or additional benefits that the consumer is willing to pay a little more for because they provide better value. You think the market's giving you enough credit and the stock is still down this year? and underperforming the broader S&P 500. You probably know as much as I do, it's very hard to predict short run what the stock will do and what the market will do. I believe when we consistently deliver top, bottom, and cash, we'll get appropriately rewarded. And to be fair to Mr. Taylor, the stock actually has had a very good run. Since May, it's up almost 30%, and that's on a combination of this very good quarter that they recently announced and the fact that the overall market has turned more defensive adding up to a pretty flat year guys because of the concerns about trade and the strong dollar and slower growth going into the year but procter and gamble has outperformed the broader consumer staples business and guys today's moves what they're talking about it's all about supercharging that growth and staying more competitive in an environment where they can't control things like the strong dollar and the cost inflation and the tariffs which are all impacting this global company gets 60 percent of its business overseas. Uh, Sarah, one thing that they can control is where they, they put their ad dollars and we know they've made uh, changes to their strategy focusing on digital media and they made some updates yesterday, right? Yeah, so they're going to continue to put more money in digital media. It's actually something David Taylor and I talked a little bit about. I said, does that include Amazon? Yes, increasing money toward Amazon. I, I asked about Facebook, actually, because he mentioned that was one of the places they see a lot of engagement, and they are trying to reach a new millennial consumer. A lot of these big brands are. And I said, did any of the privacy scandals worry you or make you reluctant to, to put money into Facebook for advertising? He said he watches it pretty closely. But no, they, st they still see it as a place to reach a lot of consumers, obviously, with more than 2 billion people on Facebook. Instagram, he mentioned, Snapchat, Twitter. So they continue to move those ad dollars there. And yeah, I think they're one of the biggest advertisers in the world. So that, so that clearly matters. And it's part of their whole repositioning of trying to get newer innovations to the consumer faster and to a younger consumer, something they talked a lot about at their analyst day yesterday. Yes, and Sarah, was there any sense of, of, of changes at all in the relationship between the big retailers? There's always been this kind of sense of a pendulum swinging back and forth where the power sits maybe at times with the supermarket chains, the big retailers, where they can kind of squeeze suppliers like P&G. Uh, is there any change on that front, or are they just sort of focused on making sure that their brands uh, just sort of outperform against the competition? They are focused on the relationship they have with the consumer, and that's a big shift for p and I mean, part of the problem with a lot of these big companies and the way they were structured before is it was all about the relationship with other businesses and retailers and getting shelf space. But obviously, consumers don't shop that way anymore. E-commerce is a huge part of the program, and they've missed out with Dollar Shave Club and Harry's coming up and taking a lot of market share because the consumer just wasn't shopping the way that they used to and they've missed out on innovations and the way that they shop. So they're hoping by this structure where the CEO of all the business units are responsible for everything, including product innovations, distributions, bringing them to the market, how quickly, how they market that, that that will correct some of that. So the focus really is on that direct to consumer relationship, which is a big shift for P&G. Mike, you know Warren Buffett talks about this all the time. Retailers have a lot of power, squeezing them on margins, on prices. Right now, what Procter & Gamble and Kimberly and all these companies have to do is they're trying to raise prices and pass on these cost increases. It hasn't really happened yet. So we'll see how the retailers and the consumers respond to that. It's going to be a big story in the second half of the year.